Delhi in association with uh, Institute of Standards and much. Gangaram Hospital. As you know, Delhi is a pioneer and capital, academic capital of the IAP also. We have 38 institutions imparting oh. postgraduate knowledge in uh, pediatrics at different sectors. Usmei, and we are holding a PG class, uh, Dr. Anupam Sajdev, sir, ke patronage mein every Wednesday. So, that's a great day for us. Well, what yeah. achai, what hai, sir. Hum logo bhi hota uh, two luminaries, Dr. Ashok Mehta and Dr. Uh, from Bilaspur, uh, Chhattisgarh, and Dr. Lakhan Poswal from Udaipura here with us. Dr. Achai. Mukesh, please take over. Dr. Mukesh is our dynamic secretary of Delhi IAP. Yes, I have met him in few hematology things. We have a lot of conversations. So, uh, it's our utmost pleasure to... <clears throat> I, I would like to uh, take pleasure in welcoming all the, the chairpersons, the moderator and the speaker. <clears throat> the chairpersons for today's session of interesting case of PUA is Dr. Lakhan Poswal. Uh, he is... Uh, I, he needs no introduction, basically, but I would still go ahead with my job. He has been executed me board member in the Indian Academy of Pediatrics in 2018 and 23. He has been the chairman in Indian Academy of Pediatrics RC 2023. Uh, he also has a postgraduate diploma in Pediatric Nutrition, Boston University, USA. Uh, he also has a U diploma in Yog Science, Udaipur. He's a senior professor of pediatrics, ex-principal and controller, medical superintendent, head of the pediatrics. Uh, medical college report and if i keep on talking Thank about you. sir then we would not be able to go ahead with our lecture so <clears throat> coming on to our second chairperson we have dr ashok mehta uh, he is a postgraduate from raipur he is a he has a flourishing practicing practice at bilaspur he has also been the president of the Chhattisgarh IAP in 2022 and he is an EB member from Chhattisgarh 2024 and he is a close friend of mine. Welcome Dr. Ashok and Dr. Poshwar. So uh, coming on to our speakers, so Dr. Anil Sasdeva sir needs no introduction. Uh, we have been his chapters and he has a mentor to us. So over to Sasdeva sir. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mukesh and the chairpersons. So today we are presenting uh, Dr. Rishabh Jain, who is a DNB fellow in uh, uh, in our Department of Pediatrics at Sagangara Hospital. He will be presenting a little tricky case, and I hope it will generate a lot of questions and discussion. So, Dr. Rishabh, are you there? Uh Sir, uh, sir, I'll request Dr. Ashok Mehta and Dr. Lakhan Poswal, sir, to speak for a minute each. Thoda kuch bol yes, yes, definitely. Uh, sorry to interrupt. Uh. Sir, it is, uh, 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 I am very thankful for uh, uh, Delhi IAP to give, give, give me an opportunity to chair uh, such a prestigious session. And uh, intensive care, uh, it is also very close to our heart because we are also practicing in some our own uh, corporate hospital and uh, 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 we do come across some cases but uh, inputs of uh, prestigious hospital from Delhi also as to our knowledge and I would be uh, learning a lot and uh, uh, I wish all the best and a very good uh, discussion at the end of the day. I won't take much of time. Over to you Poswal sir. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Alok Bandari, sir, and uh, Dr. Mukesh for inviting me in this uh, academic activity of IAP Delhi branch. Uh, I'm very happy that uh, this is a regular uh, event on every Wednesday under the patronage of uh, the legendary uh, uh, Dr. Anupam Sasdev, sir. And today the case uh, will be presented under the chairmanship of Dr. Anil Sasdev, sir. Uh, uh, I will definitely be uh, uh, in the session, uh, but in case uh, I have some unavoidable uh, work, I, I pardon to leave in between. My best wishes for uh, the success of this uh, academic activity and over to Dr. Anil Sasdev, sir. Thank you, Chairpersons. Uh, as I have already told, introduce the speaker, the presenter. 
डॉक्टर ऋषभ जैन सो डॉक्टर ऋषभ जैन यू कैन प्रोसीड विद योर केस प्रेजेंटेशन ओके सर थैंक यू सर Uh, presenting a case of an 11 year old male child who is coming from agra the informant is mother being reliable the child was received in emergency and the date of examination of the child was 22nd of march 2024 the child came to us with the chief complaints of only fever for the last two months history of presenting illness the child was apparently well two months back when he developed fever it was acute in onset it was high grade which was maximum up to 102 degree fahrenheit it was on and off and was getting relieved on taking medication there was usually around one to two spikes in a day it was not associated with any evening rise of temperature there and it was also not associated with any rigors or chills the child was showed to an uh, outside outside to a local doctors and uh, some lab tests were done for the same and parents were told that the child has typhoid for which child was given oral antibiotics for the same the child the child took antibiotics for 7 days after which the fever stopped and the child also stopped taking antibiotics child again developed fever after 4 days of stopping antibiotics it was also again a high grade fever which was maximum up to 103 degree fahrenheit it was again 2 to 3 episodes per day and the child was again shown outside and was started on oral medications child had this similar complaints of persistent fever and received multiple medications orally over the course of last one month on opd basis and was brought to <clears throat> gangaram hospital for any further management the child also has a history of weight loss of around 7 kg in the last two months which is significant and it was associated with decrease in appetite <clears throat> coming to the negative history there was no history of any persistent cough or respiratory distress there was no history of any rash or joint pain there was no history of any burning micturation or, in or increase in fre frequency of micturation there was no history of persistent loose motions blood in stools or abdominal pain there is no history of any recent travel there was no history of any contact with animals or birds and there is no history of any bony pains coming to the treatment history uh, the child was admitted in gangaram hospital and on the next day of admission the child developed respiratory distress and it was associated with fall in saturation for which the child was shifted to pcu for further management and the in pcu the child was kept on niv support which required uh, which was uh, we had to put him on bipap initially uh, it was at uh, their fio2 was 40% which was gradually tapered and weaned off over the course of next 5 days the child became hemodynamically stable and was shifted to wards the child was investigated thoroughly during the hospital stay past history there was no history of any similar complaints in the past there was no history of any admissions in the healthcare setting or any surgical procedures that was done in family history there is history of pulmonary tb in the father that was 10 years back for which he took treatment for 6 months uh, uh the child is the only child and he is a product of a non consanguineous marriage coming to the birth history uh, antenatally uh, there was nothing significant in the natal and the postnatal history also The child was a full term normal vaginal delivery with a birth weight of three kg. The child did not have any episode of respiratory distress at the time of birth. The child also had, did not have any difficulty in feedings or any uh, history of hospitalization during that stay. Immunization history: the child is immunized up to date as per the parents, but there were no documents that were presented. The child has BCG scar that was present on the left shoulder. coming to developmental history the child has attained milestones attained appropriate for his age the child is currently studying in 7th standard and he has a good scholastic performance uh, according to the dietary history using the 24 hours dietary recall method the child is currently consuming around 1800 kilo calories and 40 g of proteins for his age the recommended is around <coughs> 2000 kilo calories and a 50 g of protein per day so he has a deficit of around 20% in both calories and proteins coming to the socio economic history the uh, the uh, the family resides in a pakka house six people are residing in their house they have three rooms and uh, they have a separate kitchen and toilet there was no overcrowding uh, the house has a good ventilation uh, the father is a shopkeeper by occupation is a graduate the total family income per month is around 60000 per month they belongs to the middle upper class according to the modified kopu swami classification 
coming to the summary after my history the child is an 11 year old male child born to a non consanguineous marriage completely immunized for age came with the complaints of fever for the last two months which was high grade around 1 to 2 spikes per day and it was associated with significant weight loss of around 7 kg in the last two months and which was associated with decrease in appetite the child has also received various oral antibiotics on opd basis for the same so according uh, yes yeah uh, my first question rishab is uh, uh, can you uh, tell the all the listeners about the negative history the importance of each and every point that you took in the negative history yes with what differentials in your mind like what were you looking at yes this, this is the one yes sir uh, sir so since the child has come to us with a fever for the last two months sir so uh, first uh, since india is a very prevalent uh, uh, country for tuberculosis so i had to uh, rule out any respiratory cause for the chronic infection so there is no history of any persistent cough or respiratory distress for the same no history of any rash or joint pain i have asked for any to rule out any uh, rheumatological cause for the fever no history of burning micturition or increased <coughs> in frequency of micturition any uti that could have caused this or any no history of persistent loose motion blood in stools or abdominal pain for any uh, uh, in inflammatory bowel syndrome or uh, any uh, persistent uh, gastrointestinal cause for the same there is no history of any recent travel uh, since uh, some uh, states are endemic for certain uh, diseases uh, <coughs> or if there is any uh, history to the mountains that is uh, that could have caused uh, the child could have presented with that and there is no history of any contact with the animals uh, some uh, certain zoonotic diseases are associated with a prolonged fever and uh, no history of bony pains as to rule out any uh, rare possibility of malignancy in the child sir okay now what are the differentials that you have in your mind after the history yes sir and what will be your approach yes sir <laughs> sir after the history uh, <coughs> since it's a two month history of fever sir it goes towards a chronic <coughs> which could either be an infective or an inflammatory condition sir infective uh, since the child has a history of uh, weight loss and uh, uh, there is also history of uh, and uh, the child also has decrease in appetite so since india is a prevalent country for tuberculosis i'll keep my first uh, differential uh, as chronic infective cause with tuberculosis being the possible etiology sir second any chronic inflammatory condition sir uh, any um, uh, rheumatological cause uh, that could have caused this sir uh, for that we have to evaluate further in the physical examination and look for the findings uh, then sir since the child was to parents were told that uh, the uh, child had enteric uh, typhoid and had given oral antibiotics for only 7 days so <laughs> the next differential for <laughs> my case should be a partially treated enteric fever sir <laughs> and with the possibility of a, a rare possibility of malignancy since uh, there is a history of uh, weight loss and a prolonged fever sir so that i have kept as the last okay okay now let's see what's there in the examination yes sir uh, coming to the general uh, physical examination the uh, general condition the child was conscious cooperative <laughs> oriented to time place and person uh, the vitals that temperature uh, at the time of examination was 99 9 degree fahrenheit which was measured in the uh, with digital thermometer in axilla pulse was 104 <coughs> respiratory was, uh, rate was 24 per minute the blood pressure was 110 by 70 and saturation at the time of our examination was 98% at room air with the uh, capillary refilling time of less than 3 seconds uh, coming to my anthropometry the weight of the child is 25 kg but for his age the expected weight is 36 kg so he has a significant uh, uh, decrease in weight and he belongs to 3rd to 10th centile according to the iib growth charts the height is 142 cm <coughs> expected for his age is 144 cm and uh, so it is coming between 25th to 50th centile <coughs> the bmi for him is 12.5 kg uh, per meter square and uh, that is also uh, much less and he comes under underweight for his according to his bmi uh, this is the <coughs> growth charts uh, iap growth chart 
as you can see uh, in the uh, weight for age he is coming between 3rd to 10th centile and uh, in the height uh, he is coming between uh, 25th to 5th, uh, 50th centile so what is the interpretation of this anthropometric weight yes sir uh, sir uh, since uh, it's a uh, uh, weight is much lesser than uh, height is not as low sir it, it goes more towards that uh, the child is having any acute uh, malnutrition uh, sir the weight is much more less as compared to the height sir yes so it is possibly related with the whatever disease the child is suffering with in the last two months so it it corroborates and supports the the historical fact of weight loss as told by the parents yes sir Uh, coming to my head to toe examination, the child has uh, had bilateral cervical lymph node. Uh, this was around 1.5 centimeter, and they were present in the lower jugular region, in the anterior lower jugular region. <coughs> the lymph nodes were soft and non tender. The lymph nodes were discrete and they were mobile and can be moved in all four directions. No other areas showed any in, uh, lymphadenopathy. There was no pallor, ictress, clubbing or cyanosis or edema that was seen. Hair were normal. In eyes, there was no congestion. Oral cavity was normal. In neck, uh, uh, in neck, uh, lymphadenopathy is pre present, but there were no draining sinuses. In axilla, there was no lymphadenopathy that could be felt uh, on examination. Chest was normal. Abdomen was normal. In uh, the joints, there was no obvious swellings that were noted. <clears throat> in spine, that was normal. Skin and nails were also normal. What other areas uh, did you look at? Did you examine for lymphadenopathy? Uh, sir, uh, I looked for uh, in the uh, neck region in the axilla, sir. Then I looked in the inguinal region, sir. And uh, uh, also, sir, in the epitrochlear uh, region, I looked for lymphadenopathy. Yes. And neck means you must put your fingers on the supraclavicular area. Okay, there, there are there are times when you know the uh, the the usually the anterior and posterior angles of the uh, neck are clear they don't have any uh, lymphadenopathy but the supraclavicular area many a times if you poke your fingers in the supraclavicular area you may uh, feel uh, some lymphadenopathy so that is one area and as you rightly said epitrochlear that these are two areas usually during exams the candidates miss so that's why I want to stress upon the examination of these two areas. Okay, thank you. Uh, coming to the systemic examination, first the respiratory system, on inspection, upper respiratory tract, oral cavities, there were no dental caries, ears were normal, <coughs> in nose there was no DNS polyps or discharge, and there was no sinus tenderness. In lower respiratory tract, the trachea appears to be in the midline, Chest wall are symmetrical. Chest movement is bilaterally equal on inspection. Apex beat uh, could be uh, seen on the left uh, fifth intercostal space in the mid clavicular line. Uh, skin over the chest appears normal. There were no scars, sinuses, dilated veins, pulsations uh, that could be seen inside. Coming to palpation, there was no tenderness or local rise in temperature. <laughs> the trachea appears, uh, tracheal position is in midline. Uh, apical impulse could be felt in the left fifth intercostal space, medial to the mid clavicular line. Uh, the anterior posterior diameter of the chest measured is 15 centimeter with a transfer diameter of 21 centimeter. The chest expansion <coughs> the difference during the quiet breathing was 0.3 centimeter, and chest expansion uh, during deep breathing was around 2 centimeter. The chest circumference overall was around 54 centimeter. <coughs> Uh, into vocal phromitis uh, that was uh, done and it was uh, same in uh, uh, bilateral sides in all the areas of the lung fields. Uh, coming to percussion, it was resonant in all the areas of the lung fields bilaterally. Coming to auscultation, uh, in aus on auscultation, uh, <coughs> there was vesicular breath sounds that were present in bi <coughs> bilateral lung fields, but it was decreased on the right side in the mammary area, axillary area infraaxillary area and also in the interscapular and infrascapular area. <laughs>
uh, on auscultation, <coughs> the vocal resonance was normal in bilateral lung fields. The air entry, as I told, was uh, lesser on the right side as compared to the left in the mammary axillary, infraaxillary, interscapular, and infrascapular area. There were crepts that were present in the bilateral that crepts were present in bilateral lung fields, but it was more on the right side and it was present in the mammary area, axillary area, infraaxillary area, interscapular area, and infrascapular area. It was present bilaterally, but it was more on the right side. Coming to other systemic examination, per abdominal examination <laughs> on inspection, <laughs> per abdomen appears normal. There was a <coughs> shape appears normal. Abdominal movements were normal. There were no visible pulsations. <coughs> and there was no distended veins over the abdomen. On palpation, the it was done in the uh, in child in lying down position when, uh, with legs flexed with both uh, uh, legs flexed at both hip and knee joints. The abdomen feels soft and palpation. There was no tenderness, guarding or rigidity. The liver uh, was felt around 2 cm that was palpable under the right coastal margin. On percussion, it was resonant and auscultation, bowel sounds were heard normally. What was the feel of liver? How was the margin? Sir, uh, the margins uh, the margin were soft, sir. And the su surface? Uh, surface, because, sir, uh, sir, smooth surface, sir. There was no nodularity. That because was, 2 centimeter liver in a child with uh, <laughs> of 11 year old is uh, cannot be ignored. Okay, sir. Any tenderness? Any? We have not written about the spleen. Sir, there was no spleen palpable on examination. Sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, coming to the uh, CVS examination, there were no prominent vein or visible pulsation that were seen. Uh, S1 and S2 was heard normally and there was no murmur associated. In CNS, there was no focal neurological deficit. And the child was moving all four limbs. And musculoskeletal examination, there was no obvious joint swelling that was seen. And also there was no joint swelling on palpation. Uh, and there was no restriction of any movement in any joint that was noted in the child. Sir. <coughs> Coming to my uh, summary after uh, history and examination. Uh, <coughs> it's an 11-year-old boy with complaints of fever for the last two months. With significant weight loss, he is underweight as per anthropometry, uh, with a significant uh, bilateral cervical lymphadenopathy, with decreased air entry, uh, more on in the right side as compared to the left, with bilateral crepitations that were heard, more on the right, in bilateral lung fields, more on the right side as compared to left, with normal other systemic examination. <coughs> so, so, uh, one or two questions from my side. Uh, in the history, you said the child was admitted and he had no respiratory distress. And when he was uh, admitted, after some time, he was shifted to PICU. Yes, sir. So is there any explanation for this deterioration in the in the, in the the status of his respiratory uh, system? Like, why did it trip? He was already at, for two months at home. Yes. So is there any explanation you could find from the case sheet or from the, from, by talking to the parents um, um, or in other way, what are the possible reasons for uh, something like that happening? Sir, uh, since it was an acute respiratory distress, sir, uh, uh, possibility of pneumothorax is there, sir, but uh, it won't be as per this case, sir. Then, sir, uh, any, uh, <coughs> Did you understand my question? Yes, sir. The child had no distress for two months. He was just running fever with loss of appetite and loss of weight. That yes. these are the only three symptoms this child had. Yes, sir. And after admission, why did this child had uh, increased work of breathing so much so that he required shifting to PICU and he required uh, non-invasive ventilation? Uh, BiPAP. Yes, sir. Um, sir, there was a uh, certain diffusion. Sorry? Sir, any, sir, any lymph adenopathy that could have caused compression. Uh, why should it happen suddenly? Sudden. 
Why should it happen suddenly? Yes, sir. As you said, the progression of the disease, it was just coincidence that the child developed some pneumothorax or something. Or to my mind, I don't know whether I'm right or wrong. To my mind, possibly uh, child child was, you know, uh, was on the edge and he received, possibly he received more fluids which his body could not tolerate because his lungs are already congested. So, though, so he tripped. So he possibly developed some element of pulmonary edema because of fluid overload state. How was the P2 in this child? Sir, uh, saturation uh, at the... No, no, P2, I am saying P2. P2 uh, sound, P2. the cardiac sir, sound. P2 was normal, sir. Uh, it was not loud, sir. Well, there is a possibility, because as you are saying, the crepitations and all, there is a possibility of underlying pulmonary hypertension also in this child. Okay, sir. So, my thought process is why after two months, the child did not have any problem and the moment he is admitted in the hospital, he is shifted to the PICU within 24 hours of admission. So, there we need to explain this phenomena. Yes, sir. There should be some explanation for this. So now come to the now. So what is your uh, uh, working diagnosis in this child after history and examination? Yes, sir. Uh, sir, uh, <clears throat> since the child had a uh, fever for more than uh, four weeks, sir, and uh, the child also has a feature on examination that is Krebs and decreased air entry uh, that is present more on the right side, sir. So it goes more uh, towards the diagnosis of a pneumonia, which is a persistent pneumonia, and uh, the possible uh, causes for it could be divided into either an infective cause or a non-infective cause. Since uh, <coughs> it's a, there is a history of uh, weight loss, so uh, first uh, tuberculosis should be kept first. Then other infective cause that could have caused this it could be a fungal cause. And the third, any acquired immunodeficiency uh, such as HIV, since the child also had lymphadenopathy and weight loss and uh, uh, with the persistence of uh, pneumonia for uh, around two months. Sir. And in the non-infective uh, causes, uh, we have to rule out uh, certain uh, autoimmune conditions, certain vasculitis. Uh, we have to also rule out immunodeficiency and uh, a rare possibility of malignancy also we have to rule out. And uh, other uh, rare causes uh, down the list could be any uh, granulomatous uh, lung disease or any <laughs> interstitial lung disease in this child? Uh, I, I want to go back to the history. This child uh, has fever and has chest findings suggestive of pneumonia, right? Not consolidation because there is no bronchial breathing. Yes. Sir. But yes, scattered crepitations and then the reduced air entry on one side. So that is suggestive of some pneumonic process going on. Okay. So... Prisha, can you can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. So, uh, I I would have appreciated if you have given us the history of exertional dyspnea, orthopnea. You should have gone more gone more de into the details of this thing show. Yes. Because sir. that's very important. The parents may not realize that the child is running fever and he is on the bed for the last two months. He's watching TV or doing something. But when he goes to the bathroom, does he feel breathless? Because he is 11 year old, he could have answered your questions very nicely. And uh, in these cases, particularly, we should ask, they may not show dyspnea uh, uh, at rest, but when there is an exertion or there is a possibility of orthopnea in this child, should have been ruled out. So I would have appreciated if you had gone into, that, on, into these details. Yes, sir. And even the cough on exertion, he may not be coughing at rest, but on exertion, uh, like going to the bathroom or walking around in the house, definitely he must not be going for play or something, but uh, cough at that point of time. So that would have added, uh, given us some clue regarding his, his uh, uh, cardiopulmonary uh, functionality. Okay, sir. So what are the points uh, as you have put in the diagnosis of persistent pneumonia? So how do you 
how do you say that this is a persistent pneumonia what are the features in in favor yes sir uh, <clears throat> sir we say the child uh, any uh, child is having persistent pneumonia when there are uh, signs and uh, signs or symptoms and uh, radiological uh, evidence of uh, no we uh, don't know about the radiology right now yes, we sir. just know the history and the examination yes sir sir uh, since the child is having uh, uh, fever for uh, more than a month and uh, uh, he also has a uh, crepitations with decreased air entry on examination so uh, based on my uh, history and examination and it's a uh, prolonged <coughs> for more than what is weeks. what is prolonged what is is there any time frame for persistent pneumonia yes sir sir more than 4 weeks more than 4 weeks yes so it varies in different uh, uh, you know uh, papers or you know publications but on an average everybody accept that any respiratory issues which are related with pneumonia persisting for 4 weeks can be defined as a persistent pneumonia and you have already discussed about the tuberculosis anything uh, in favor of fungal or uh, hiv uh, sir uh, uh, hiv sir there is a lymphadenopathy and uh, decreased weight also sir mm. <laughs> uh, sir fungal sir uh, uh, there is nothing that uh, signifies any immuno uh, <coughs> deficiency or the child looks immuno competent based on examination sir but uh, so what are, what are the precursors uh, what in what are the points in history one should ask uh, uh, mm -hmm. pertaining to fungal pneumonias uh, sir uh, sir they will have a persistence of uh, a wet cough sir uh that can happen with anything um specific people people who stay in very old houses damp houses then uh, uh who deal with the this um um cow dung and uh, uh and especially the now they are in the villages you know they have uh, uh cow sheds and all so these are the animal contacts as you said birds so these are the issues which can be i love you have already dealt with so these are the thing or travel going to forest areas so they some some of the fungi or interstitial lung diseases can also be there okay sir but there is no past history of any repeated hospitalized something so yes the differentials anything from the chair persons i mean do they agree with this list yeah i agree sir uh... so bone pains somehow did, did i miss uh, did we appreciate whether the child has bone pains yes sir bone pains so there were no history of any bony pains sir any transfusion history uh, maybe i missed it any transfusion history of any blood transfusion still then uh, no sir i didn't write it but there was no history of any uh, transfusion blood transfusion sir. right right Okay, Rishab, go ahead. Yes, sir. Uh, so these were the investigations that was uh, that were done. Uh, so I'll just uh, tell about the important investigations. So the before twenty uh, second, these are the investigations that were done outside. The child was uh, having a continuous maintaining a hemoglobin of around eleven, and when the child presented to us, he, uh, his hemoglobin was nine point six. Nine point six. The TLC count was uh, around eight to. Uh, Eight to ten thousand, and uh, initially outside the uh, child once had a reading of uh, creatinine of one point three, but when he presented to us, uh, his creat was uh, point eight. 
and he didn't uh, SGOT SGPT also at our hospital was 30 and 11. Uh, on uh, 16th outside, there was one uh, investigation of calcium that was 12.15 in this child. But uh, uh, when he came to us, uh, his calcium was around 9.4. <coughs> Uh, his uh, he was uh, he had normal uh, sodium and potassium level initially, and it was around one thirty four when he came to us. His CRP uh, was showing uh, the value from seventy four to forty eight to sixty seven uh, when he presented to us, and uh, ESR was on an on increasing trend of twenty seven seventy four and hundred and two. The child ferritin level that was done was two sixty. So, any explanation for the creatinine of 1.38 uh, uh, before admission and 0.8 in 0.7 with us? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, sir, it would have been because of dehydration or pre-renal cause of, uh, sir, uh, this uh, raised in creatinine since the burn was also 70.92 mm. at that time, sir. But, any other uh, reason? Any other reason? Uh, We really don't know the uh, the treatment history in detail. You know, what type of antibiotics or uh, medications the child received. Yes, sir. So possibly uh, some nephrotoxic drugs may be going at that time. Yes, okay, sir. Were these investigations done on the OPD basis or uh, sir, child was admitted at that time? So they were done all on the OPD basis, sir. There was no admission. Okay. Hmm. So, as you said, the child may not be taking enough fluids. Um, but uh, at that time in the month of March, in it was not very hot. So, possibly the dehydration is second. My, the, the idea that comes to my mind is nephrotoxic drugs. Because am I, uh, aminoglycosides, intramuscular use is very rampant in the private practice. Okay, sir. So, possibly nephrotoxic drug is one possibility. Okay. Um, uh, other investigations that were done, uh, abdominal ultrasound that was done, it was showing liver of 11.2, uh, liver span of 11.2 centimeter with a spleen of 11.8. And it was showing few hypoechoic mesenteric lymph node, the largest being 12 into 11 mm. The gastric aspirate was done for the child, uh, in which uh, gene expert was sent, which was negative, and ZN stain was done, which was also negative. Vidal was done for this child, which was showing a ratio of 1 is to 80 for Salmonella typhi O. Um, uh, uh, for other uh, tropical uh, other infections, we have done Brucella IgM, which was negative. Leptospira was also negative. Urine RM done, which, uh, <laughs> which was not showing any pus cells, and the urine culture was also negative. Blood cultures done were negative. Quantiferon TV gold was done, which was also negative. And the <laughs> HIV spot test was done, which was negative. And the 2D echo for this child uh, also did not show any abnormality. Yes. Why echo was done? Um, sir, uh, echo, uh, sir, because of the sudden deterioration only, sir. Uh, uh, and also, sir, in case of uh, any... Uh, Prolonged fever, sir, it could or uh, infective endocarditis also is a possible uh, cause for prolonged fever, sir. So, any vegetation okay. we have to see. Uh, Anything else? Um, sir, also, uh, since there was sudden deterioration uh, in uh, uh, myocarditis, um, uh, no, you had kept a differential diagnosis of autoimmune disease. Yes, sir. So, mm -hmm. sir, what can, well, 11-year-old child, unlikely, but we have seen in 13-year also during the COVID time, but that, uh, uh, pericardial effusion. In, in certain autoimmune disorders, you will find pericardial effusion, silent pericardial effusion. So, it's important. Yes, sir. Yes, um, go ahead. Uh, coming to the chest x-ray uh, for this child, uh, so it's a chest x-ray of an 11-year-old male child. That's a <laughs> PA view uh, with the cent uh, central and uh, it was adequately exposed. 
uh, adequate exposure. Uh, the as you can see in the X-ray, uh, uh, we can see uh, bilateral uh, reticulo uh, nodular opacities that were present in bilateral lung fields, and it was uh, <coughs> there is haziness that could be seen in the mid zone in the right side, and uh, if you uh, the mediastinal widening is also seen, mediastinum widening is seen. That is most uh, probably it could be the paratracheal uh, lymph node that would have enlarged and caused this uh, mediastinal widening. And uh, <clears throat> the costophrenic uh, angles are spared. And uh, 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 the, uh, the cardiac borders, the right cardiac border is uh, seen and the left uh, cardiac border is uh, uh, not properly appreciated. Sir. So what do you think is this? Is it bronchopneumonia? Is it consolidation? Is it miliary tuberculosis? What what is your interpretation? What do you think, um, sir? It's it's not a miliary uh, tuberculosis, sir. It, uh, sir, the on the right side, uh, uh, the this looks like a consolidation, uh, which the haziness, sir. But uh, the reticulo nodular opacities, sir, uh, it's, since they are so extensive, sir. Uh, um, uh, sir, it's more of a diffuse uh, uh, lung problem than a... Rishabh, uh, my advice to you and to all the exam going DNVs is that develop the habit of in reading an x-ray because you will definitely get x-rays in your exam. So reading an x-ray in a systematic way in a systematic way. I mean, you have explained quite a, uh, you know, quite a few findings. But if you uh, explain uh, lung and then mediastinum and then cardiac border and then uh, soft tissue, you will miss something. So develop the habit of uh, reading an x-ray in a systematic way. So this should come, this practice you should do every day so that during exam, you, you know, you speak like a parrot. Okay, I know it is from outside to inside or inside to outside. Center to periphery or periphery to center. So develop this habit. So there are certain findings also. As you can see, there are bilateral paratracheal lymph nodes which are there. You can see the splaying of the trachea. The, look at the right and left main bronchi. There is a splaying. So that's a very important radiological sign that there is a subcarinal lymph node. Okay. And if you look at the right side, the left side is less involved as compared to the right side. That's why you had clinical findings on the right side. More. Yes. Right. And yes. these are bilateral infiltrates. Some nodular <laughs> shadows are there. Nodules are also small in size. And you can see there is some space in between. There is some uh, normal lung is also seen, especially in the right upper and the left lower. Now you can see in the zoom this, you can see the small nodules, which are there. These are called centrilobular nodules. You can always see some uh, normal lung around the lung. And this is, you, if you appreciate in the mid zone, you can see the horizontal fissure. In the horizontal fissure, this is the horizontal fissure, right? And you can see the nodules around this horizontal fissure. Similarly, on the right side, left side, you have said that this is the left ligular lobe which is affected. That is why the left margin of the heart is not visible. And this peri the, these nodules are going right up to the periphery. The sparing is only of the left upper and little part of the right upper. Don't don't comment on the lobes in a PA view. If okay. you say zones, it is acceptable to all the examiners because you cannot comment except, except for the right middle lobe consolidation where the right heart is slotted or the left side, as in this case, we call it slotting. So this is what the slot sign is. Okay. Yes, <laughs> Yes, sir. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, sir, coming to the CT scan, CECT that was done for this child. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, as uh, we can see, the uh, it's the coronal section of the uh, CECT chest 
and it is uh, showing us the media channel window and uh, in this picture uh, uh, we can appreciate as the para tracheal uh, lymph nodes which uh, could be appreciated um, in the next in this picture uh, we can uh, see the uh, cervical uh, lymph nodes that were that we had seen in the examination part you, we can see the bilateral cervical uh, lymph nodes in this picture <laughs> And, these are, uh, these, are, these are more of the supraclavicular location than the jugular location. Jugular lymph nodes will be little higher. Similarly, on the right side, you can see more lymph nodes where you, where you are pointing. Just go yes, little sir. up. Yes. Just go little up. Little, little medial. Little medial. Yes. These are again the lymph nodes. Okay, sir. You can see the lobulated things. Yes, lobulated sir. structures. These are again lymph nodes. Yes, sir. And uh, in this picture, we can see is the uh, the bilateral hilar uh, lymph nodes that uh, we can appreciate in uh, this picture. So there is bilateral symmetrical lymphadenopathy. Yes. It is almost symmetrical on both sides, paratracheal as well as hilar as well as cervical. Cervical. So it's a symmetrical bilateral lymphadenopathy. Yes. That's a very important point. Yes. And there oh. is some calcification also. You have missed the calcification part. You can oh. see the speckling, little stippling of the uh, of the lymph node. Yes. yes. Over this. Yes. Yes. Little bit down. Little bit down. Yeah. You can see these whitish dots. Yes, sir. You can see these whitish dots. Yes, sir. Similarly, in the hilar area, left hilar area, you can see the little calcium. Yes, sir. Little up, 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 up. Little medial, yes, sir. little medial, medial up, go up, up, sir. up towards the hilum, little bit higher. Sir, yes, this, this one. You can see this white is. Yes, sir. This is calcified. This is calcification. Okay, sir. Uh, so uh, this is the uh, lung window, and <laughs> we can see is the diffuse uh, thickening uh, that could be seen, and it is. Uh, present in uh, in the diffuse in uh, both the lung fields, and as you can see, it is more uh, the around the uh, fissure, and also in the peripheries, the there is extensive thickening that is present of the. In this. What did you say? Thickening. Uh, no, there is yes, no thickening. Sir. Where is thickening? There is no thickening. These no. are the these are the nodules. These are nodules. Okay, these are sir. micro nodules which are there. These are called centrilobular nodules, which are extensively spread out more on the right side than on the left side, and they are. Mm -hmm. uh, if you see, they are covering right up to the pura. So you cannot see a normal lung margin when the nodules are there. And these are along the uh, fissures. You can you have you have shown, you just have shown. So these are along the fissure. You have shown it is along the bronchovascular bundle. bundle. In the right side, you can very clearly see it's going along the right, uh, bronchovascular bundle. Yes. So the so this is what is called as lymphatic spread. Lymphatic. These nodules are along the lymphatic spread. Lymphatic, uh, lymphatic vessels, sorry, not the lymphatic spread, lymphatic vessels. And there is, uh, I think in one of the cuts, there was some breakdown also. Do you have any other axial section or coronal section? Uh, one does. Yes, yes, yes. Sir, in this axial section also, we can see the bilateral uh, cities and uh, uh, you can see there is extensive uh, nodularity that could be seen and it is more around the uh, fissure and uh, around the bronchovesicular margins. Yes. And in on the left side, in the lower part, yes, in the sir. dependent area, you can see a consolidation. Consolidation. Yes, this is consolidation with breakdown. 
so this was the CECT chest uh, report, uh, which was showing conglomerated lymphadenopathy with internal calcification, which was visualized in bilateral uh, lower cervical region, right more than the left and in the mediastinal locations with the bilateral paratracheal lymph nodes, prevascular, subcarinal, and bilateral hilar location, which was associated with the extensive uh, with extensive nodular calcification in multiple nodes. Extensive <laughs> nodular parenchymal thickening is seen in both the lungs with the, <laughs> the perilymphatic distribution along the peribronchial and the fissural pattern, and they appears to be coalescing to form consolidation in the lower lobe region. So what is your interpretation? Now you should narrow down your diagnosis. <clears throat> yes, sir. Uh, sir, now, sir, since there is a paratracheal and a symmetrical bilar uh, bilateral hilar, uh, this thing, sir, so the differential, uh, it's, uh, uh, sir, it, uh, since uh, peribronchial and uh, uh, perilymphatic distribution with bilateral hilar uh, lymph nodes is uh, very uh, characteristic for uh, uh, sarcoidosis or uh, granulomatous lung disease, sir. So uh, we should also look into that now. And uh, we will not rule out uh, tuberculosis. We have to keep uh, tuberculosis also uh, in a possible uh, differential, sir. And uh, so now you are narrowed down to granulomatous lung disease. So which is again a very, very huge topic. Yes, right? Yes, sir. So Granulomatous lung disease in India, it is almost always tuberculosis until unless we have some clues which we have already seen in the CT scan, which is pointing towards some other etiology. So, how will you proceed now? Sir, uh, in this, sir, uh, after this, we have done a bronchoscopy and uh, uh, the findings uh, that were done on uh, bronchoalveolar lavage. There was a cell count of 270 and it was showing a uh, lymphocytic predominance of 70%, sir. Uh, in this also, the TB expert, uh, gene expert was sent, which was negative. Uh, gram stain was showing uh, polymorphonuclear cells and routine culture done was negative. Fungal KOH was also negative. CD4 is to CD8 ratio that was done at this uh, ball was 0.2 is to 1. Why? What is now the what is the interpretation? Sir, Even the uh, bell is negative. Sir, in this we, sir, the... work, we still have to prove our diagnosis that this is not TB. Yes, sir. <laughs> sir, uh, uh, sir, there is a lymphocytic predominance in the cell count. Uh, did not you did not get lectomen in this in the bell? Since um, we were concerned, because fungi is also one of the causes for granulomatous lung disease. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, sir it, it did, sir. I, I forgot to write in this. Uh, it was uh, negative, the galactomenon acid test, sir. Okay. Then, uh, sir, uh, we did the lymph node biopsy of the cervical lymph node, sir. Uh, it was showing us uh, non-necrotizing granulomas with the, the foci uh, that, sorry, with the foci of parenchymal fibrosis and inflammation, which was uh, composing of lymphomonocular uh, mononuclear cells. These areas also shows decrease, uh, discrete appearing epithelioid cell granulomas. There were no necrosis that was seen in this. And uh, we have also done a gene expert in this also, which also came negative. Then uh, based on our uh, lymph node uh, findings and uh, CT chest, and, uh, we did a uh, thorough ophthal examination, but there were no features of any iridocyclitis. There were no uh, uveitis. <coughs> the examination of cornea, lens, and retina appeared normal. Then uh, to rule out any uh, vasculitic uh, cause for uh, granulomas, we did uh, C anka and P anka. Uh, 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 that also came negative. Then <laughs> we did the serum uh, angiotensin converting enzyme levels, which was 97. The normal is 8 to 52. So it was on the higher side. <coughs> and uh, we also did an NBT DHR to <coughs> rule out chronic granulomatous disease. But uh, it also came uh, normal or negative. 
so uh, sir uh, our final diagnosis which was based on our clinical picture the radiological evidence uh, the radiological evidence with characteristic findings with raised ace levels uh, we made a diagnosis of uh, pulmonary uh, sarcoidosis in this child sir <coughs> so uh, that's an interesting case but uh, uh, how what are the causes for uh, granulomatous lung disease sir uh, causes for granulomatous sir first is uh, uh, granulomatous with polyangiitis or wegner's granulomatosis sir uh, <coughs> then sir uh, second is uh, uh, in case of chronic granulomatous disease sir uh, then uh, sir uh, more common causes are uh, tuberculosis and uh, sarcoid uh, tuberculosis then uh, uh, sarcoidosis sir uh, uh, so rishab it will be easy for you to reply in exam if there is a such case uh, of uh, granulomatous lung disease to to divide granulomatous lung disease into infective and non infective <coughs> so if you divide them into two categories then it will be easy for you to reply in infective as you said tuberculosis fungal what are the fungal fungi which are associated with granulomatous disease sir histoplasmosis uh, histoplasmosis uh, Cryptococcus, yes, then uh, uh, mycosis, those things. Aspergillus is also associated. Aspergillus fungi is associated. <laughs> and uh, then, uh, uh, then you have the non-infective causes, where you have already mentioned that uh, granulomatous uh, and polyangiitis, then eosinophilic granulomatous polyangiitis. Then uh, what we call as we used to call as Wagner's and uh, uh, what do you call that uh, Chuck Stewart syndrome. Yes. Yes. Sir. yes. And uh, then the other are interstitial lung diseases are also there. Like hypersensitive yes. pneumonitis can present like granulomatous disease. And come some occupational diseases. Uh, Very nervous like uh, silicosis and all those uh, can present like granulomatous disease. So regarding this ACE, what is the importance of this uh, ACE uh, test uh, in granulomatous disease? Uh, sir, uh, this is not how, the... How will you uh, the, sir, uh, this is not the uh, very uh, characteristic test for uh, any specific disorder, sir. Uh, sir, it's basically... The, uh, sir, it can be uh, increased in case of... Uh, all uh, sarcoidosis also and then tuberculosis also and uh, uh, sir uh, but <coughs> in this since the, we had a clinical picture and characteristic finding we, so uh, yes ACE, ACE levels are only a supportive evidence if your clinical picture radiological picture is compatible with granulomatous disease and suggestive of sarcoidosis then ACE levels are important. If your uh, if your uh, clinical and radiological picture is not suggestive of sarcoidosis, then ACE level there can be may not be taken into account, and it can be increased if, as you said, tuberculosis, fungal pneumonias, lymphomas, Lymphoma. then even uh, uh, what do you call pulmonary tumors? Some some pulmonary tumors can also cause rise in ACE levels. So it is always taken as a supportive evidence and not as a diagnostic evidence. Yes. Sir. So what, are, what is the treatment for this child now? Yes, sir. Uh, sir, uh, sir uh, so the treatment that was uh, given for this child, sir, at admission, initially when the child came to us, it, we had started the child uh, initially on monocef and symptomatic treatment, sir. Then the child developed respiratory support and was <laughs> taken to the PICU where uh, NIV support was given and we upgraded the antibiotics to uh, septraxone and ticoplanin. Then uh, based on our chest x-ray finding and a strong uh, clinical history of uh, significant weight loss, we initially had started the child on a four drug ATT, sir. Uh, but uh, after our, uh, uh, based on our uh, CT findings and the lymph node biopsy report and the raised ACE level, and the child was not improving. <clears throat> we had to give a pulse dose of methylprid at uh, 20 mg per kg. 
for three days, sir. After which the child showed a dramatic improvement and uh, the child became uh, hemodynamically stable and was weaned off NIV and was shifted to wards. So uh, after that, the child did not have any uh, fever spikes and uh, the child was discharged on... Uh, we, are, we are still awaiting for the culture reports and uh, and we had sent the child on a four drug ATT and uh, oral prednisolone at two mg per kg. My personal feeling is it is very very unlikely that we have not got anything positive in favor of tuberculosis except for history of tuberculosis in the fam in the father that is okay. ten years back. So even if we give this child prednisolone and that not to in this high dose of 2 mg per kg, we can give up to 0.75 to 0.5 to 0.1 mg per kg in divided doses. Uh, it should work. And usually for pediatric sarcoid, you give prolonged prednisolone uh, for at least few months and then taper it over the next six months. And keep a close watch uh, on, uh, on uh, clinical uh, features. And once you have uh, uh, started this child on ACE uh, on uh, steroids, we can keep a watch on the ACE levels. If the ACE levels are coming down, that is again a supportive evidence that the patient is responding. But if once we stop the treatment and the child shows some symptoms and the ACE levels start rising, it may it means that there is a relapse of the disease. So we can use ACE level in a child in a patients who have high uh, ACE levels, we can use them as a, as a, as a follow-up marker. Okay, sir. So anything from the chairpersons, please? So there are few questions in the uh, in the question answer box. Uh, there is regarding plural effusion. There was no plural effusion uh, in any of the X-rays or in the CT scan. Pulmonary embolism. Okay, the pulmonary embolism radiologically there was no uh, you know very catastrophic uh, event in the history. That is one thing. Second. The radiology, the child was shifted to PICU. <coughs> child was shifted to PICU. That is, as I said, fluid overload one. And the pulmonary embolism can be always be considered in a sudden deterioration in respiratory status. But the X-rays were not in favor of pulmonary embolism. In pulmonary embolism, you always have, uh, you know, uh, if there, is a, if there is a shower of uh, uh, thrombi, then you will have shadows which are wedge shaped and they are usually at the periphery of the chest. And these are the basically wedge shaped infarcts which are visible on the X-ray, especially in the CT scan. So nodular shadows are not seen in the pulmonary embolism. Miliary tuberculosis, uh, the nodule size, as you said, the nodule size was bigger. The nodule is usually from three, uh, three to four or uh, five to ten millimeter in size, but milleries are always less than three, like two millimeter, like that. So that is millery is out. And uh, then was the biopsy of lymph node via? No, no, we did the excision. Excision biopsy was done, Rishab, right? Yes, sir. Yes, it was cervical. It was not EBUS that we did uh, from the bronchoscope through the bronchoscope. Why ATT as the diet? Yes, I agree with that. We can stop ATT, but uh, I think it is just a hesitation. Sarcoid is far rare and TB is far more common. And in India, both can stay together. But I agree with you. This is a very convincing case of sarcoidosis. We can stop ATT. Duration of weight loss is as said in last two months. Instead of four drug ATT, only INH prophylaxis. I don't think so. There's no, no, no family history currently. So INH prophylaxis the, is, is not desirable. Uh, there is one query. No, this is just that Dr. Ashok Mehta has left us. 
and he has written uh, best wishes and nice presentation and nice discussion. If there are any questions, uh, we are ready to take or Rishabh will answer them. <clears throat> so any comments by anybody? Very worked up uh, uh, case, sir. I must uh, appreciate that. I was thinking that this is malignancy somehow, but uh, uh, <clears throat> making a diagnosis of sarcoidosis is even more tougher. Yeah. Wonderful presentation. Wonderful. Very well described, all differentials, every aspect, wonderfully covered as expected from Sasdevasa. Nothing can be missed. <laughs> Nothing can be missed. Salute to you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Rishabh. Wonderful presentation. Thank you, sir. So, back to the organizers. <clears throat> right. So, Thank you, uh, Sanjeeva, sir. Thank you, Dr. Rishabh, for a wonderful presentation. If there are no more questions, we can close the session. Is it fine, sir? Absolutely. Yes, sir. Yes, It was a very, very elaborate discussion. I was like, Anil Ji, he's taking a lot of college. He's a student. He's a lot of trouble. He's a lot of trouble. Don't ask so much questions, sir. No, sir. If you ask so much questions, we'll give you a simple question in the exam, right? Very nice. Good. Hello, all the best. Thank you, Richard. I want to make an announcement for a small one. Please, please. We launched the E-Neonatology course in Delhi IAP. We also have to join the children too. So it will be a good review of Neonatology in a weekly session on Sundays. Dr. Rishabh, you should know that you will get a weekly session on Sundays. We will also talk about the details. We will also talk about the details. Dr. Anil Sridev can also take it from the other side. And the other side, you can contact any of us. Or must have seen its flyer flying all around in IAP. Yeah, I, I have already received it. So, <laughs> so circulate it in your local PGs group. Yes, I will do that. I will do that tomorrow. So, this is a very fine. This is also our Gangaram role. Dr. Pankaj Garg from Gangaram Hospital is the brain behind this course. And he has sum up the whole neonatology course. Sunday weekly class on Sunday morning. Hai. एक घंटे की और अगर बाय चांस किसी की मिस हो जाती है तो दे कैन ऑलवेज गेट अ रिकॉर्डिंग लेटर ऑन आफ्टर द कोर्स इज कंप्लीटेड इट विल बी अ वेरी यूजफुल थिंग प्लीज एनरोल फास्ट थैंक यू जी थैंक यू थैंक यू गुड नाइट